Okay, so this will be our first Bible study, and this, this will be the first outreach from 2017. And uh, just for the record, we are in Oxford, the capital of academia. It's fair to say that Cambridge is on a equal par with Oxford, and so far it's been a beautiful start to the day. And like I say, this is the capital when it comes to academia. All the bright sparks come here, future prime ministers, future presidents, members of uh, the elite. And therefore, it's probably worth spending a few moments today looking at the subject of atheism, because we will no doubt come into contact with Darwinists. And uh, if we do, it's good to have some information to offer in response to people that may wish to critique our presence. So let's start, if we may, like I say, our first outreach in 2017 and our first group Bible study from 2017 in the Psalms, Psalm chapter 14. Psalm chapter 14, and look at verse 1, please. The fool hath said in his heart, there is no God. They are corrupt, they have done abominable works, there is none that doeth good. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They all gone aside, they all together become filthy, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. So man starts bad, and if he's not saved by the age of 18, there is a 97% chance that he will never get saved, and go on to remain bad. The Lord looks down from heaven, and he sees wickedness. None understand, nor seek God. And the Calvinist comes along and says, well, there you are, you see. No one seeks the Lord. So the Lord has to use irresistible grace to bring sinners unto himself. Well, not necessarily. What the Lord did do was come to earth in the person of Jesus Christ to seek and to save that which was lost. And because he did so, man is able to be saved. That starts also back in the garden, when the Lord God is looking for Adam and Eve. And he says to Adam, where art thou? And of course, Adam was hiding from the Lord. And Almighty God knew where, the, where uh, Adam was, of course. But he wanted Adam to come clean. He wanted him to confess that he had messed up. But here, you are called a fool, from Psalm 14 to. But it goes back to a heart issue. The fool hath said in his heart, not in his head, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. There is none that doeth good. Of course, you can't do good when it comes to your salvation. Your best works is altogether vanity. But the problem is much deeper than that. Go to Jeremiah. In Jeremiah, uh, Jeremiah chapter 17, the weeping prophet, a great type of the Lord at the first advent and a great type of the Jew during the tribulation, would tell us from Jeremiah chapter 17, verse 9, how the heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked who can know it. So you start bad, and even after you are saved, your heart is still wicked, although it's been circumcised, although you have a new nature. If you don't yield to the Holy Ghost, it can still be a problem for you. And that's why it's imperative to get saved and keep the old man down. Don't allow sin to get a hold of you and keep yourself close to the Lord. The heart, man or woman, saved or unsaved, is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked who can know it. So Psalm 14 and Jeremiah 17 fit together quite nicely. It's a heart problem. It's much easier not to believe in the Lord. It's much easier to do your own thing. It's much easier to make your own rules up. Go to Matthew chapter 11. So like I say, if you're not saved by the age of 18, the statistics suggest that there is a 97% chance that you will never get saved. And by the grace of God, I am that 7% that got saved after I was 18 years of age. But for Matthew chapter 11, the Lord Jesus Christ builds on these two Old Testament passages, which are very much neglected in uh, so-called Christian circles. And in Matthew chapter 11, look at verse 25, please. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast said these things from the wise and prudent, and hast revealed them unto babes. Now, the cross-reference to this is also very interesting. If you keep your hand there in Matthew 11, and go to Luke uh, chapter 10. In Luke chapter 10, look at verse 21. In that hour, Jesus rejoiced in spirit and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that thou hast these things from the wise and prudent 
and has revealed them unto babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Here the Lord is rejoiced. And as far as I know, this is the only time in the New Testament where Christ rejoiced. And he's rejoicing at the fact that the Lord has kept this back from the wise, the prudent, the academics, the, uh, the elite, the sort of people that we might meet this coming week. And he's rejoicing the fact that they can't grasp it. But go back to Matthew chapter 11. Matthew eleven twenty five again. At that time, Jesus answered and said, I thank thee, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, because thou hast hid these things from the wise and prudent, and has revealed them unto babes. So the verse is quite clearly concerning creation, concerning the Lord's deity, concerning the revelation of Almighty God. And because they won't receive it, verses 20, 21, 22, 23, Christ rejoices. People don't have to think about that. The fact that Christ is going to rejoice and does rejoice that people that are overly bright are not able to receive it. And it speaks about the Lord laughing in the heavens at the wicked. And I remember when I was much younger, my grandmother said to me, you're so sharp, you will cut yourself. Well, she was partly right. I had an uh, old head on young shoulders, but I wasn't saved, of course, at that time. But here the Lord is rejoicing from Luke 10. Look at verse 26 from Matthew 11. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in thy sight. Even so, Lord, let it be. It's their fault. They don't want to receive it. They're not interested because their hearts are desperately wicked. They've said in their heart that there is no God. 27, all things are delivered unto me of my Father. And no man knoweth the Son but the Father. Neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. So the context is quite simply this, that the Father sends a Son to preach the gospel. And bit by bit, the Lord reveals more of his ministry to those that he comes into contact with. It starts with the apostles. It then goes to the 70. And it will also concern those that hear the gospel and get saved. But the problem is, the heart is no good. Your heart is dead. Your heart is wicked. And that's why, if you don't get saved by the age of 18, there's a 97% chance that you will never get saved. So keep those verses in mind. And what I want to now do is look at evolution if I may, because like I say, this is a city which will be filled with very bright men and women, and most will be evolutionist, most will be in the camp of Richard Dawkins and guys like him, and most have never heard the opposite. Most have never heard creation, or if they think they know about creation, they probably don't really understand it. Here are some great quotes from leading scientists who had the following to say. Sir Ambrose Fleming quotes, Evolution is baseless and quite incredible, close quote. Sir William Dawson, quote, Evolution is utterly destitute of proof, close quote. Sir Fred Hoyle, quote, As a young student, I was brainwashed into accounting everything without God, close quote. Sir Francis Bacon, quote, Let no man think or maintain that a man can search too far or be too well studied in the book of God's word or in the book of God's works, close quote. Sir Bernard Lovell, quote, more scientists believe in creation than disbelieve, close quote. Sir Clark Pennick, quote, Evolution is the cultural myth of the 20th century, close quote. Sir James Allen, quote, I came to see that resemblances between families, orders, classes, etc. are due to the work of a creator, not common ancestry. Salvador Dali, quote, The announcement of doctors Watson and Crick on the DNA code is for me the real proof of the existence of God. And these people may not have been saved, but they rejected evolution. They were academics. They were scientists. Sixty leading scientists, including 24 Nobel Prize winners, affirm that only God can explain the complexity and order of life as we know it, including Arthur Schwarzlow, winner of the Nobel Prize of Physics. In 1981, 22 British biologists said evolution is not a fact. So already we can see there are a group of men that would reject evolution, that would not be of the opinion that it was factual, but because they are part of academia, because they teach in seminaries or colleges or universities, they have to teach evolution. And yet someone comes along, a young student, who holds to the scriptures, and they are made to look like a fool. And yet such people wouldn't dare take a Muslim to task. I can't imagine Richard Dawkins ridiculing an Islamic student. Can't imagine it. And yet I know for a fact that he would ridicule young Christian uh, scholars. In fact, we knew one lady who went to Oxford many years ago, and she wasn't saved. 
and she came from a Catholic background, and she told us that she sat in his class, Dawkins that is, and he ridiculed Christianity, he ridiculed the Bible, and yet that same old reprobate wouldn't dare take on Islam, wouldn't dare take on the Hadith, wouldn't dare take on Muhammad, but he would certainly take on Christianity. In fact, such people like him have made a good living out of attacking creation. But when it comes to the universe, when it comes to how we are here and the purpose of us being here, there's only really four options. Number one, the universe came from nothing naturally. This violates the first law of thermodynamics. Please note, you cannot create energy or matter. Number two, the universe came from nothing supernaturally. Theists believe this to be the only probable and plausible option. Number three, the universe has always existed. This violates the second law of thermodynamics. It should be pointed out that the Earth, if it had been a fraction of just a billion years old, as some people would suggest, then by now you'd have about 150,000 people per square inch on the face of the Earth, which of course would be somewhat problematic. Number four, the universe is not real. It is simply an illusion. Only mentally insane people believe this to be the case. And I think of David Icke when I come to such a position. David Icke would have you believe that this is not real, that this is just a mirage. And I watched him being interviewed a while ago online, and he was talking to uh, a journalist in Estonia, I think it was. And uh, the interviewer was somewhat puzzled by David Icke's, I won't call it a ministry, but his existence, his purpose. And Icke said, well, this is all an illusion. It's not real. Can't you understand that? And I thought to myself, wouldn't it have been great to say, David, can I have the keys to your car, please? Or can I have your credit card, please? Because it doesn't really exist. Or can I have your wife? Because she doesn't really exist. It's so foolish. So four options. One more time. The universe came from nothing naturally. That's what the evolutionists would have you believe. It just evolved by chance. But the problem with that is that it clashes with the first law of thermodynamics. The universe came from nothing naturally. Or the universe came from nothing supernaturally. We would hold to that. Theists, Christians... Jews and Muslims also, to be fair to them, also believe this to be the only probable and plausible option. The universe has always existed. Well, that is going to clash with the second law of thermodynamics, because everything is breaking down. If you have a car, it breaks down. Most people have to wash their windows once a week, once a month. You have to wash your clothes. You have to iron your clothes. Because if you don't, it deteriorates. You deteriorate. Everything breaks down, which of course is a pattern of the universe. Or number four, again... The universe is not real. It's simply an illusion. And therefore you come into contact with somebody who is mentally insane. And we, you know, we meet many of these people in the streets who think that this is simply an illusion. It's not real. We go back to the Ike scenario. Put the case to him that if it's not real, can I have your credit card? Can I have the keys to your car? Can I have your wife? Because you're not real. Your bank account isn't real. Your car is not real. Such people are kidding themselves. But around 1903... Well, there was a scientist, I should say, called Herbert Spencer, an atheist scientist who taught that everything in the universe came down to the following five components. Time, force, action, space, matter. Now look at this. In the beginning, time. God, force, created action. The heaven, space, and the earth, matter. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. You got time, you got force, you got action, you got space, you got matter. So here you've got an unsaved scientist teaching creation and science and not even being aware of it. So I think with those opening thoughts, you are shown very easily and hopefully very clearly that the belief that evolution is somehow universally accepted is incorrect. And I gave you just a handful of men, not necessarily saved men, but scientists that didn't believe in evolution and as a result would go on record and say so in fact another quote for you from dr paul lemon i think he pronounced his name who was the editor of the french encyclopedia quote evolution is a fairy tale for adults close quote but of course if you come out with that kind of a statement you are put in a difficult position and you live in the uk you get state funding if you teach at a school or a university and i thought to myself a long time ago that if the british government would spend as much money on creation as they do on evolution. The students would be given much more light, much more material. But of course the state is secular. The churches have capitulated. In fact, most churches hold to uh, theistic evolution. 
They don't believe in a young earth. They don't believe in a six-day creation. And as such, they are also deceiving young students. At last count, there was over 30 miles of obsolete books on evolution throughout the world. 30 miles. Just a tiny minority of books remain in print and circulation over 100 years. And the Bible continues to be the best Sell book in the world, the King James at last count has sold over a billion copies, has been translated into over 900 languages, apparently, and yet evolution continues to evolve. The theory continues to evolve. But go back to what I just said a few moments ago. If the Earth is 4.5 billion years old, then you'd have to work out from that date that there'd be 150,000 people per square inch on the face of the Earth, which of course would be impossible. The way the Lord has set the whole thing up, would be that 150,000 people die every day and 150,000 people are born every day. You couldn't have sorted that out yourself. You couldn't have created that yourself. You couldn't have guessed it up yourself. It's so finely tuned that only a creator could be credited for such a thing. But we get into relativism. We get into postmodernism. We get into, well, you have your truth and I have my truth. We get into uh, the laws of uh, logic. The laws of logic are transcultural. For example, every country in the world, when you come to a red light, you stop. Murder is murder. And yet people say, well, that's just your opinion. But it's not just my opinion. If you break the law, you go before a court, you'll be, fined, you, you know, you'll be found guilty of your particular crime. So if the laws of logic are transcultural, then why are we forced to accept that one person's view is more important than another's? If I keep your hand where you are from the Gospel of uh, Matthew... And turn to Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Matthew chapter 12. Look at verse 34, please. O generation of vipers, how can ye being evil speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaketh. Jesus speaking. Once again concerning a person's heart. See, the heart is no good. Your head says one thing, but your heart says another. 35. A good man out of the good treasure of the heart bringeth forth good things. And an evil man out of the evil treasure bringeth forth evil things. Two types of people there. 36. But I say unto you that every idle word that men shall speak, they shall give an account thereof in the day of judgment. And that's what we try and tell people. That what you say and do, like your rejection of creation, your attack against the scripture, the ridicule of Genesis, the dismissal of Revelation, will have consequences. 37. For by thy words thou shalt be justified, and by thy words thou shalt be condemned. Words are powerful, and that's why it's so important to try and speak to people, especially young people that are not too indoctrinated. On top of that, it is fair to say that when you speak to people in a group, they don't want to lose face. They want to give the impression that they're all on the same page. And yet when they go home and they are, they are on their own, their conscience starts to get a hold of them. So that's why it's always worth uh, not getting too discouraged, perhaps, if you come into contact with a group of people who approach you in a pack and pretend to be on the same page. The main belief, I guess, that is taught today is the brotherhood of man and the fatherhood of God. People know that say to us this week, well, we're all God's children. Jesus loves us all. But who's going to critique that? Who's going to correct that? We will. We will say, no, Christ said, no man comes to the Father but through me. You must be born again. So we go back to the Old Testament, which is what this all comes down to, and go to uh, Deuteronomy chapter 18, and we hopefully are able to spend some time with an inquiring mind, somebody who may be interested in the things of the Lord, and we deal with the four options like I've given you. We give them the quotes from the so-called scientists that evolution is a joke, and then we go back to the scripture. Because that's what this is all about, the scripture. Not what I think, not what we think as a group, but what the scripture says. And we find from Deuteronomy uh, chapter 18 a prophecy from Moses in verse 15. Deuteronomy 18, 15. The Lord thy God will raise up unto thee a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren like unto me. Unto him ye shall hearken, according to all that thou desirest of the Lord thy God in Horab. In the day of the assembly, saying, Let me not hear again the voice of the Lord my God. Neither let me see this great fire any more, that I die not. So 15 and 16 is a prophecy from Moses, a Jew, to the children of Israel. 
that one day a prophet would come to them, A, like Moses, and B, from amongst themselves. And yet if you speak to Muslims, they will think that this is speaking about Muhammad, which is somewhat of a joke, because Muhammad was not a Jew. The Lord thy God, Jehovah God, will raise up unto thee, the Jewish people, a prophet like unto me, or a prophet from the midst of thee, of thy brethren, like unto me. Almighty God is going to raise up a prophet from the midst of thee, from among yourselves, of your brethren, twelve tribes of Israel, and he'll be like unto me, unto him ye shall hearken. There's a great prophecy concerning the coming of the Messiah, foretold here, 1500 years BC, that Christ would come. Go to John chapter 1. And yet Muslims think that Christ was a Muslim, that Moses was a Muslim, that Abraham was a Muslim, that all the patriarchs were Muslims, which of course is not only a joke, but a great offence to Almighty God. John chapter 1, John chapter 1, look at verse 19 please. And this is a record of John, when the Jews sent priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, Who art thou? And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I am not the Christ. Who are you, John? We've seen you baptizing, we've seen you preaching, we've seen you having quite a following. We know your father, we can remember your mother. Who are you? Where do you get your authority from? These sort of questions that the Catholics like to ask Christians. 20. And he confessed and denied not, but confessed, I'm not the Christ. I'm not the Messiah. That's what was in their mind. Is this guy the Messiah? Is he the one that Moses spoke about? 21. And they asked him, What then? Art thou Elias? And he saith, I am not. Art thou that prophet? And he answered, No. That prophet being from Deuteronomy 18. See, the Jews were waiting for the Messiah to come. They knew that he was Jew. And yet they weren't sure as to who John was. 22. Then said they unto him, Who art thou? That we may give an account to them that sent us. What sayest thou of thyself? Now, of course, had their hearts been right with the Lord, they would have known that John was a prophet, sent with the same anointing that Elijah was sent with, and also would dress the same way that Elijah dressed. Explain yourself to us, John. 23. He said, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Make straight the way of the Lord. As said the prophet Isaiah, get ready for the Lord your God. He's coming. And when he comes, he has got a message for you. And it's a very simple message. Repent. Turn or burn. Believe on me. So you got a clear prophecy from Deuteronomy, cross-reference to John, that the Messiah would come. And they thought that perhaps John was the Messiah. But of course, John, as far as I know, never did any miracles. Go to John chapter 5. When Jesus Christ would arrive, he did many, many miracles. And one of my messages for this week will be concerning the Master and his miracles. But from John chapter 5, we read from verse 39, Jesus speaking. Search the scriptures, for in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. The scriptures being the Old Testament. That is such a statement. Search the scriptures, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. The entire Old Testament is about Christ. The entire Old Testament is about the King. The entire Old Testament is about a kingdom. King, kingdom, King Christ, Messiah. Search the scriptures, the Tanakh, for in them ye think ye have eternal life, but you have to be a doer of the word as well. And they are they which testify of me. 40. And you will not come to me that you might have life. There's the problem. Your heart is desperately wicked. The fool has said in his heart, there is no God. It's quite fair to say that perhaps some of the Jewish men that Christ would clash with were atheists. Yes, religious, went through the system, were very much thought of as being uh, special, were part of the priest system, aristocracy, the sort of people going to meet this week, very bright, very academic, but not saved, not born again. And here... The inference is on the fact that people won't come to the Lord to be saved. Not that they can't come to the Lord to be saved, which is what the Calvinists would have you believe, but that they won't come to the Lord in order to be saved. 41. I receive not honour from men. I don't need honour from anyone. I didn't come to please anyone. I came to do the Father's will. But I know you, that ye have not the love of God in you. What a thing to say. I know your hearts. Your hearts are dead. Your hearts are black. You're filthy. 
you're wicked. Man starts bad and he ends bad. And even after he's saved, he has to yield to the Holy Ghost. He has to keep the old man down. But I know you, Jewish leaders, that ye have not the love of God in you. You may be Abraham's physical seed, but big deal. Your hearts are not circumcised. You must be born again. 43. I am come in my Father's name, and ye receive me not. If another shall come in his own name, him you will receive. Partly picturing the Antichrist, and I believe that the Antichrist will be a Jew. Some people think the Antichrist will be a Muslim. Some people think the Antichrist will be the Internet. But I think the Antichrist will be a Jewish man, personally. A type of Judas. You think Elijah, John the Baptist, Judas. And people think that Judas will be resurrected to be the Antichrist. I don't go for that myself. I know people have that view, but I think the devil the spirit that took over judas will probably take over the antichrist i'm come in my father's name and you receive me not so it's their fault if another shall come in his own name him you will receive antichrist of course how can you believe which receive honor one of another and seek not the honor that cometh from god only so again it's on the fact that they won't believe they could believe but they won't believe on top of that, they want honour from one another. They want to quote one another. Rabbis during the first century would quote one another. Rabbi such and such would say this. Rabbi such and such would say that. Jesus comes along and says, but I say this. And it would just shock them. This guy preaches with authority, not like the scribes and the Pharisees, because, of course, he is God manifest in the flesh. He is the author of the scripture. 45. Do not think that I would accuse you to the Father, there is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom ye trust. Because Moses wrote about him, Deuteronomy 18. Moses was a type of Christ, rejected, married to a Gentile. Christ is married to the church, being Gentile, of course, for the most part. But overly of importance to me, or the main point from this piece of scripture, is that Moses is going to accuse them. But of course, the problem here is that they trusted in Moses, like Catholics trust in Mary. Catholics trust in the Mass. Muslims trust in Muhammad. People in Oxford this week probably trust in evolution, Darwinism. They know that to believe in what we believe is going to cost them an awful lot. It's hard to be a Christian. You know, we discussed this last night for some, some hours. It's difficult to be a Christian. It's difficult to carry this burden of having to speak to people, trying to witness to people, trying to reach out to people. Do not think I would accuse you to the Father... There is one that accuseth you, even Moses, in whom you trust. I guess at the great white throne judgment, when all of the world are resurrected to be judged, you have the, you have the uh, saved church there, the saved Jews there, and they'll see all of the unsaved dead resurrected, and perhaps even the word of God will be opened. 46. For had you believed Moses, you would have believed me, for he wrote of me. It's powerful stuff. For had ye believed Moses, the first five books of the Old Testament, you would have believed me. Why? For he wrote of me. But if you believe not his writings, how shall you believe my words? You've got tradition as well here. You've got the Babylonian captivity. You've got the Jews following a system of tradition, like the Church of Rome does. And therefore they have negated the Old Testament. They have knocked it out. They have completely uh, watered it down. And therefore you've got religious people on the surface, externally, but internally are dead men's bones internally are lost internally are enemies of the lord the hearts are desperately wicked they are corrupted and they are corrupting other people and that's why it's so important to get saved the moment you can so i will close this two-part message now we've been talking for over 30 minutes and just make some final points before i return to this subject tomorrow and say that what we are going to experience this week is a mind problem that should be quite clear by now. It's a mind problem. It's a heart problem, of course. It's also a mind problem. If your heart's desperately wicked, it will affect how you think, how you speak, how you operate. Now, your brain, your mind, knows right from wrong, of course. And your mind, your brain, knows how things should be. But if your heart is filthy, if your heart is contaminated, if you've been deceived, it's going to have a knock-on effect to all other parts of your body all of the parts of your system. That's why it's so important to have a clear conscience and to read the scriptures every day. I'm speaking about saved people, to renew our minds each and every day. But 
I guess the overall thoughts from this morning's message will be that the heart is no good and that's why we need to be honest with people and say that you're no good. Your best works will never be any good as far as Almighty God is concerned. Your religion will never save you. Your external righteousness will never save you. Being the best you can will send you straight to hell upon death. But if you repent, if you turn to the Lord in faith, he will save you and he will keep you saved. And I will come back tomorrow, Lord willing, and spend some more time looking at this problem of uh, evolution, vain philosophies, deception, corruption, and being part of a pack, not wanting to be the odd one out. And I'll close it there. Okay, so this morning we sat down and looked at some uh, interesting verses, and I was able to give you some quotes from academics that pretty much put evolution in its place. And yet, if you question evolution, if you are a student studying under people such as Dawkins and you dare to question it, you are very much punished, you are chastised. So the problem has to be, well, what do we do about it? Well, we can't kill it directly. It's like Catholicism. You'll never completely decapitate the head of Catholicism. The best you can do is put doubts in people's minds and try and uh, use as much scripture as is possible to collapse such a system. In fact, this morning we were discussing Calvinism, and I made the case that if you can uh, knock one of the uh, tulips out, the whole thing collapses, which is absolutely true. So I think the best thing we can do as Christians is to spend a few more minutes this evening, our second look from the scripture today at evolution, and just do what we can to understand the mindset which is pretty much endemic. And from Proverbs 14, we read the following from verse 12. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. That verse is found twice in Proverbs, because the writer of Proverbs, being Solomon, what you know that such is the case. Here it's 1412, it's also found in 1625. There is a way which seemeth right unto a man or woman, but the end thereof are the ways of death. It goes back to relativism. It goes back to you have your truth, I have my truth. How do we know which is so? Of course, the problem with such a view is that it not only is deceptive, not only is it dangerous, but it can also be demon possession. A lot of these people are sick mentally sick. In fact, we spent all day in Oxford today looking at people and a lot of sick people out. Mm -hmm. People talking to themselves, singing to themselves, arguing with themselves, drunk people, uh, drug addicts, messed up people. And I thought to myself, this is a great city, historically, academically, and yet what has it done for these people? Evolution is great in a school classroom. It's like Lordship Salvation. You go to your seminary, you go to your class and you're taught a particular way of belief and it sounds great in a classroom but you try and put that into practice in real life there was an event which took place in uh, South Armagh back in 1984 in uh, Ireland and uh, South Armagh I should say was IRA bandit land dangerous land dangerous territory and at that time a British group of soldiers were dropped into uh, South Armagh on a recce and they got in trouble. They came under fire from some IRA snipers and a young corporal was shot two or three times and he was bleeding to death. And at that time a mayday call went out to uh, their base somewhere outside of Belfast to be uh, airlifted. Now the rules were quite simple around that time that if a British unit came under enemy fire, especially in South Armagh, IRA bandit land, there was no way that a rescue mission could be launched because it was just too dangerous. But the Lord's providence played a part in this because what happened was this uh, platoon of maybe a dozen men got on the radio, put this mayday call in, and the Chinook, I think it was a Chinook or Lynx helicopter pilot team got the mayday call, scrambled, jumped into the chopper, flew 25 miles, 30 miles from Belfast to uh, South Armagh, were able to land the helicopter, jump out, and literally take this group of soldiers, airlift them, from uh, South Armagh and fly them back to the UK. Now protocol said, we don't do that. Protocol said if you are injured under enemy fire in hostile terrain, we can't go in and get you out, it's too dangerous. And yet when the Mayday call came in, it went straight to the pilot who seemed to bypass the control tower, jumped in the Chinook and got those guys out. 25 years later, and this is how it came to me on a recent documentary I watched, 
the guy who had been injured wanted to find the man who got him out of this very dangerous part of uh, Northern Ireland. But because they fought in Northern Ireland over the last 60 years, there's a, what do you call it, a blanket ban. Information is uh, sealed, much like uh, Martin Luther King, 15 filing cabinets sealed until 2068. And this guy wanted to find who this brave pilot was, but the British military weren't telling him because it's sealed, it's confidential. Of course, the concern would be that the IRA could find out who this person was and assassinate him. Well, lo and behold, he got a well-known uh, media organization involved, which I shan't name, who tracked this guy down to California. And this guy's probably in his 50s now. And interestingly enough, he's a Hollywood producer. He's done quite well for himself. And this man um, flew from Britain to America to meet this man, to thank him for saving his life. It's quite an emotional scene to see him being reunited with this uh, pilot who's now a Hollywood uh, producer. Long forgotten about this particular incident. But the point is this. What is taught in a classroom, like Lordship Salvation, and maybe I get a chance to discuss that shortly, or Evolution, doesn't always play out in reality. The rules are quite simple. If you are shot down or if you come under enemy fire, tough apples, we can't get you out. Lordship Salvation teaches that if you don't live it, you lose it. Or if you're really saved, you will live a crucified life. And if you don't live a crucified life, maybe you're not saved. And you take those people out of their seminary environments and put them into a warehouse environment or put them into a construction site or put them onto a ship with commercial sail uh, salesmen, or not salesmen, uh, sailors, fishermen, they will fall pretty fast because they are surrounded by unsaved men, pretty rough and ready, as we would say, and they will start to backslide because that's the power of the flesh. And therefore, when you come up against evolution and you start to drill into what these people teach, it's always worth reminding such people that China, for example, under Mao Zedong, killed millions. Joseph Stalin, we discussed him just a little while ago, killed millions of his own people, thought nothing of his own children. Both of his wives took their own lives because they couldn't live with such a monster. And yet the left love this guy, look up to him, applaud him. So what you are taught in a classroom is all very well, but when you get into the real world, it's such a different ballgame altogether. This is what I think Solomon is telling us here from Proverbs 14, how there is a way which seems right unto a man or woman, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Which goes back to Ike this morning. I just use him as an example, a very successful individual running a successful enterprise, I guess I should perhaps use as a, as a term to describe what he does. But he too is deceived, he's dangerous and perhaps dim possessed. And because he believes that this is simply an illusion, he in many ways sort of plays down the severity and even the sacredness of life. You know, life is important. You, know, you get one life and if you waste it, you lose it. So I think Proverbs 14 helps us to understand some of the mindset concerning such people, how they are convinced that they are right. And yet, like I said, I think it was last Sunday, every communist country around the world which follows evolution, Darwinism, the moment they fall and they have a general election, the people don't go out and vote for them. The people don't want them. Even in Russia, there's a tiny, tiny minority of people who vote for the Communist Party. And I'm sure if North Korea was to fall tomorrow, that wicked dynasty would just be wiped away. Nobody would go out Cuba. in votes, Cuba too, in large numbers. Which takes me to another scripture from uh, Psalm chapter 9. And this is very relevant especially concerning the UK, a very secular country. And I think, as uh, we've said before, things will get worse, not better. But from Psalm 9, uh, Psalm 9, verse uh, 17, please. The wicked shall be turned into hell, and all the nations that forget God. You take evolution, you teach it in the schools, you throw creation out, you ridicule the Bible, or you go down the high criticism route, you make fun of the King James Bible, you bring in these modern translations, you completely destroy evangelism for ecumenicalism, you're going to become a third world country overnight. In fact, I thought this a while ago. To the best of my knowledge, and I'm happy to be corrected, but to the best of my knowledge, France has never produced a great soul winner since the Reformation. I may be wrong, but as I'm sitting here tonight, I can't think of any famous Frenchman since the Reformation that was a great soul winner. Leave Calvin out. I know he had French background, but as far as France as a country is concerned, I can't think of anyone. Belgium, I can't think of anyone. Holland, Denmark, Norway, Scandinavia, Spain, 
maybe, maybe not, no one comes to mind. You've got an entire continent since the Reformation. I think Spain didn't have the Reformation. Okay. Therefore, I'm thinking that even if it had the Reformation, who could we say was a great solar in Spain? No one. So you've got an entire continent which has come and gone and just perished. Britain, as far as I know, and I'm happy to be corrected again, hasn't produced a great soul winner in over 150 years. The last great soul winner would have to be Charles Spurgeon, I would think. I can't think of anybody since him that would street preach, that taught the King James verse by verse, perhaps Booth, but he's the same sort of generation yeah. to uh, yeah. Spurgeon. We've lost two, three, four generations. Now, the Americans are very different. The Americans have got a lot of soul winners. And like I said before, if they're not dead, they've, no, they are now retired. But as far as Britain is concerned, it, there's just no one that I can think of, really, that would be worth mentioning. So the wicked shall be turned into hell, and I mean hell, and all the nations that forget God. Once you go down this path of evolution, once you go down this path of attacking Scripture, attacking God, and attacking His people, you have to put something in its place. And what do you do? You put evolution in, because it's easy to preach, it's easy to teach. Do as thou wilt, isn't that what... Uh, that awful man Crowley, who came from a Plymouth Brethren background, would say, do as thou wilt, and he was banned from several countries. Mm -hmm. Awful man. So hold those thoughts, and I want to give you some more quotes from well-known uh, scientists who had the guts to say the following, quote, Dr. Rendell Short, who taught the writers to arrange events in the correct order, divine inspiration. Now, I'm not saying these people are saved, necessarily, but this is one man, Rendell Scott, a doctor, a PhD, who was quite right when he said the following one more time, who taught the writers to arrange events in the correct order? Divine inspiration. We hold to that. We don't think this world came to be, pure by chance. Even uh, Jean-Paul Sartre publicly stated his faith in God just prior to his death. Now, I'm not going to sit here this morning, or this evening, as it now is, and suggest these people are saved. But this man went from being an atheist to a theist. He confessed faith in God, and I take it to be the God of the Bible, uh, Jean-Paul Sartre, uh, Catholic background. Perhaps he was born again, I don't know. But it shows a shift. It shows that when these people were challenged, or as they got older in life, as most people do, they mellowed. And you don't hear this type of thing preached because it's not popular, and on top of that, it's heavily funded. A man called Dr. Lewis Bonora, he was the director of the Zoological Museum and director of research at the National Centre of Scientific Research in France, declared the following quote, Evolution is a fairy tale for grown-ups, close quote. Now, I didn't say that, mm. although I believe that. This is a top scientist, a director of a zoological museum in France, coming out with that statement. Evolution is a fairy tale for grown-ups. Now, they believe it because they know that if they don't hold to evolution, they have to hold to creation. And to hold to creation for them is a nightmare. So they throw out creation and they desperately cling to evolution because to not do so puts them in the camp of creationism, which of course is what we would hold to as Bible-believing Christians. One very final time, and I'll move on. There's only four options as to how we came, how the universe exists. Number one, the universe came from nothing naturally. Second option, the universe came from nothing supernaturally. Three, the universe has always existed. Four, the universe is not real. It's simply an illusion. That's all you've got. The first option violates the first law of thermodynamics because you can't create energy or matter. The second option is what we hold, that this universe came from nothing supernaturally, and we credit that, of course, to the triune God. The third option is that the universe has always existed, which, again, is impossible because everything's always breaking down. Laptops get old and they break down, or your mobile phone gets old and it starts to pack up, your battery starts to go south, your car starts to collapse, you know, we get old, we get sick, we die. Everything's breaking down. So the belief that the universe has always existed is impossible, and on top of that, that also violates the second law of thermodynamics. And like I said this morning, had the Earth been here for four billion years, which is now pretty much taught by most Darwinists, the statistic has been put forward that not only would uh, the universe have burnt out maybe 35 million years ago, but on top of that, you'd have 150,000 people living per square inch on the face of the Earth. It would be completely impossible but you see, you're not taught this in schools. You're not allowed to question this. You go to school, you go to college perhaps, you go to university and you are taught this. And you don't dare challenge it. And if you do, you are very quickly frozen out. 
So people say, well, why is the Bible rejected? Well, man is against the Bible because the Bible is against man. The Bible tells you what you are. The Bible says you're no good. The Bible says you are filthy rags. The Bible says we've all sinned and come short of the glory of God. The Bible says there isn't a just man on the face of the earth that doeth good and sinneth not. We're no good. From the cradle to the grave, we're no good. And I believe that even after we are saved, we're still no good. We're kept by grace. In fact, I saw a quote on, maybe in Facebook a few days ago, from uh, Leonard Ravenhill, a great British preacher, a holiness preacher. And he made the comment that to call yourself a saved sinner is an oxymoron term. I use that term. I'm a saved sinner. Mm. I'm not going to kid myself and say that I'm now born again in 15 years and I've got it all sorted out. I don't fail. No way. I am a saved sinner. I'm saved from my sin, but I'm sort of a sinner because my blood's no good. This world is no good. And we are still experiencing the curse. Some people like Ravenhill come along with such a statement. I go back to murder thought. What he was able to teach in his classroom to his students or to his church audience is all very well, but he didn't live in the real world. You know, he didn't uh, work in a factory with uh, ordinary people. He wasn't on a boat at sea six months of the year. He wasn't on a building site. You know, he was very much studying his books. He was a teacher. He was a pastor, shall we say. And that's why you got to be careful when you come across these people. Because what you preach in your classroom, like that RAF incident back in Belfast in the 1980s, doesn't always play out in real life. And that's why I wish some of these guys would close their mouths. And I use Ravenhill as an example because he's still very much highly thought of. A Brit who went to America and made good. But in reality, he's doing more harm than good. And he's also failing to articulate the two natures in the believer. So man is against the Bible because the Bible is against man. Man's conscience knows that he's no good, and that's why most people, when they see us on the streets, walk around us. Because they know that if they walk towards us, they may make eye contact with us, and perhaps we may draw them in to a deeper discussion. On top of that, if you think of the cults that do street work, quote-unquote, they're not there to get you saved. They're there to get you into their system. On top of that, they're very careful what they say to you. For example, if you were to approach a couple of JWs, or a couple of Mormons, and sometimes, you, you, know, you will see them on the streets, more JWs than Mormons. If you ask them a controversial question, they won't answer on the, on the street. They'll say, come along to our meeting house, and six months down the line, we may answer your question then. Whereas us, like lambs to the slaughter, many times get into controversial discussions. Because we are trying to save people's souls. We know that people perish at you know, a moment's notice. That's why we do what we do. That's why we are here for the next several days. You know, you know, we know that time is of the essence. And that's the difference between a relationship and religion. Organized religion and being born again. Enjoying a relationship with Almighty God. So people reject the Bible for many reasons. And of course, the, the overall reason is they love their sin. Let's be quite honest about it. It's easier to do your own thing. I get up when I want. I go to sleep when I want. I can do this. I can do that. I don't want to be told what to do. But you are told what to do. You're told by your parents what to do. You're told by your teachers what to do. You're told by your employers what to do. And you're told by the state what to do. All this talk about I'm a free spirit. You're not a free spirit. There are rules in society. In fact, just last week, I saw President Trump queuing up to go into some uh, fundraising events in Florida. And he queued, and he queued, and he queued. And I thought he's got 600 men all around him, women too, armed to the teeth, the most powerful man in the world, and he's having to queue with his third wife to get into this VIP event. He's having to go through some kind of a system, some kind of who are you or can we check your pass? I'm not quite sure what the holdup was, but all his power didn't help him bypass the queue. It was very interesting to watch. He looked somewhat uncomfortable with having to wait, and of course the media were there to film his unhappy face. But I thought, yeah, interesting to see that even he has to, you know, wait. Even he has to submit himself to rules. And that's a great picture, surely, for the great white throne judgment. So we get attacked for being Bible believers. We get attacked for what we do, which is fair enough. You know, we were called unto service. We were called to suffer for the Lord. It shouldn't be any other way. And yet politicians, such people who pass laws against us, will attack us, like I say, ridicule us, like I say. And yet they never, ever attack pornography, alcohol, tobacco, etc., etc. You hear these politicians who are Darwinists at heart say that they are for the family. But when was the last time they ever came out against such vices? How about never? And of course the booze industry, the alcohol industry, and the tobacco industry, and perhaps the porn industry, fund such politicians. They are killing our society. They are strangling our society. But like the old expression goes, you get the governments that you deserve. And I think it's going to come down to this, that once we are raptured, 
it's going to be a very dark place. At the moment, I say in the UK, it's probably 97% dark. There's about 3% remnants of Christians. So at the moment, they haven't got it all their own way. At the moment, we can stand on the streets of the UK, preach the gospel, make videos, do sermons such as this, critique and rebuke such wickedness. And it's good to do that, of course. But the time will come that when the rapture has been and gone, we're out of here. This world's just going to collapse. It's going to be like a power vacuum. I guess like Vietnam, 1975, when the Americans pulled out. Absolute chaos. And you've got these American aircraft, uh, these American aircraft carriers off the coast of uh, Hanoi and part of parts of Vietnam. And they're pushing planes off the decks to make space for people to get from Vietnam onto the aircraft carriers. I mean, two, three, four, five million dollar planes just being pushed off these aircraft carriers because they needed space, not just for the uh, Vietnamese they were trying to get out, but for American diplomats, Westerners, absolute panic. The Viet Cong are going to come. Darwinists again, they're going to kill us. And of course, that's what happened. They breezed in, took uh, the whole country and ransacked the American embassy. Terrible, terrible to have to experience such a thing. The same must be true back in 1945 when uh, Germany fell and the Russians got to the gates of Berlin and uh, Montgomery and Patton and Eisenhower were told to stand back, stand down. And they stood down. That was the order from London and Washington. Let the Russians go in first. They feel hard done by. And you've got maybe three and a half million Allied forces outside, Ber uh, excuse me, outside Berlin, outside Germany, wanting to go in, knowing what was going to happen when the Russians arrived, and terrified Germans, women of all ages, raped from, I think, six years of age, yeah. up until the, the 70s, 80s, absolutely brutal. Over a million abortions took place, 1946. And those poor people were just left to the mercy, if you want to use that word, just absolutely destroyed by these Russian conscripts, most couldn't read or write, bulldozing into the most civilized country in Europe at that time and just raping their women. You say, why was that? Well, two reasons. Number one, the Germans went for Hitler. They went for a Catholic demon-possessed man who was also a Darwinist. They threw out the word of God. And when that man fell, the entire country collapsed and they paid such an awful price. Like I say, over a million abortions took place in 1946. This is what happens when you turn from Almighty God, that's why it says from, again, Psalm uh, 9, 17, how the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. What else do you expect? You can't live your own way indefinitely. If you drink to excess or if you gamble to excess or if you smoke to excess, you're going to destroy yourself. Sin kills you. Sin kills. And somebody might say, well, you know, you shouldn't be on the streets telling us this. You know, you're giving us a hard time, we don't feel comfortable about it. Well, let me say this to you. Every time you go into a news agent to get some milk or to get some bread, you will see uh, cigarettes on display and they got warning, smoking kills. And in the UK, maybe it's the same in Spain, I don't know, graphic photographs of people dying of cancer. Maybe it's the same in Asia, I don't know. But here, graphic photographs to warn people of the dangers of smoking. So if the government can do that, if the government can warn you, about your physical sins, can't we warn you about your spiritual sins, your eternal sins? Why are we condemned for speaking out against your lifestyle? No one else is going to tell you what we will tell you. And I say we, I mean Bible believers, those of us which are around the world. So I will close it there. I won't go, any, I won't go on any more today. We'll do a part three tomorrow. It's getting somewhat late now, but I just wanted to go over what we went over this morning and just drive home some of the consequences when you turn from the Lord. The great thing is, and I will say this, that God is the God of second chances. In fact, I got an email just a few days ago from a chap, a very tortured chap, and he was raised by a somewhat, how can I put this, uh, retarded father who thought that to go to heaven, he had to be a good boy, he had to get good grades at school, and he said to me in his email that he suffered with some kind of, uh, how did he word it now, he... Uh, has some kind of mental issue. He wasn't able to concentrate, not particularly bright. And his father said to him, well, whatever his name was, if you don't get the grades, hell fire for you. This stuck with this man for some 20 years. He's now in his mid-30s. And he said to me, I was an awful alcoholic. You know, I couldn't get by in life. My father told me that, you know, only good boys go to heaven. Is it too late for me? He gave me some scriptures from uh, 
Hebrews, if we sin willfully and, uh, you know, you've crucified the Son of God afresh, there's no more sacrifice for us, so on and so forth. And I got back to him, so I've got good news for you, there's always hope for you. Those verses from the book of Hebrews are not for you. Those verses from Hebrews are for Jews. Hebrew means Jew. And this poor guy, being tortured for decades because of his father's retarded stand, retarded statements, I don't know how else to describe it, stupid statements, had completely destroyed this guy's mentality and just took him into a completely dangerous way of life, you know, a dangerous mindset like these evolutionists. There's no truth. There's no such thing as, as sin. Do as you want. Um, there's no right and wrong. You say, well, can I have the keys to your house? Or can I have your wife? Or, you know, can I have your daughters? If there's no right or wrong. There's no consequences. It becomes crazy. I think Pol Pot, when he came into government, went back to the, the, uh, the year zero. He went right back to zero. And he killed millions of his own people following evolution, survival of the fittest. And you think to yourself, where are the Christians in all this? Where were the Christians in Germany back in the 1930s? Where were the Christians in Russia during the 20s and the 30s? Where were the, Christ you know, where were the Christians in Vietnam or any of these countries when these monsters arrived? I believe there's, there's more saved people probably in China today than there are in the whole of the world. I think I heard last time there's about 80 million saved Bible believers in China living, again, in a Darwinist country, communist country, a wealthy communist country, of course, maybe champagne socialists, I don't know, but technically they are you know, living in a Darwinist country, and yet they are praying, and probably praying for us in the West, and don't we need their prayers? So that's what happens when you get evolution, you get catastrophe, death, rape, famine, just people being obliterated, being destroyed, and yet if you have a Christian in government, if you have a man or woman who loves the Lord, there's peace, there's joy, there's that sense of safety. It may not be perfect, this is an imperfect world, but I'd much rather live under a decent theist. There are no Bible believers in government anywhere in the world today, but I'd much rather live under a government which at least is openly theist, at least openly friendly towards theism, than be part of a government which is anti-such and puts people down and also pushes on you their belief, their religious belief, because it is a religion. They will fight for it. They will fight for their religion of evolution. Well, if that's what you want, you can have it. But uh, as they say, you are dead a long time. So you need to make sure that you know what you know, and you owe it to yourself to take the time to study your religion somewhat more closely and check these quotes that I gave you this morning and also this evening. And we'll close it there and pick it up tomorrow, Lord willing, and we will look at part three. Okay, so this will be day number two. This will be study number three, looking at atheism, looking at evolution, looking at Darwinism, and hopefully for today I will spend some time looking at Charles Darwin. Well, Darwin was just an ordinary man, and yet his philosophy has very much uh, affected the whole world. And what he came out with continues to cause problems, and we read about such from 1 Timothy, 1 Timothy uh, chapter 6. Look at verse 20, please. O Timothy, keep that which is committed to thy trust, avoiding profane and vain babblings and oppositions of science falsely so called, which some professing have heard concerning the faith. Grace be with you, or grace be with thee. Amen. It is possible to start off on the right track and then to go down a cul-de-sac and never get out. And here Timothy has been commissioned to avoid Profane and vain babblings, probably to concern or concerning Judaizers, concerning genealogies. And I would uh, take this to be in reference also to not fall into Catholic traps like where do you get your authority from? Or how do you know your Bible is correct? Or we go back to St. Peter, all that nonsense. Avoid it, it's foolish, it's vain babblings. But on top of that, and oppositions of science falsely so called which some professing have aired concern of faith. So I suppose it's fair to say that you can start off on the right track and get involved with theistic evolution, get involved with the old earth position, and once you go on that track, not only do you lose your testimony, but it's fair to say you will lose a lot of scriptural truths. The earth is a young earth, and that was proven when man went to the moon in 1969 and was able to discover that the dust on the earth was very light, and the inference of being on the moon, excuse me, that the moon landings would prove that the earth was old, 
but when man arrived on the moon, the dusts were thin, not very heavy, not very uh, substantial. And like I say, people have thought that because this was an old Earth, also they've been led to believe that the dust would be very thick, and it wasn't. It's a young Earth. But to teach that is problematic. To teach that will result in many people going on to lose their grants, going on to lose their standings. Paul wants you to know that you can fall, and some have erred concerning their faith, which again needs to be repeated time after time. But when we look at Darwin, we need to be reminded that he was raised by his father, not his mother, when he was only eight years of age. And he was raised in the Unitarian Church, which, to those of us which are saved, is a cult, it's a false religion. Charles's father and grandfather were Freemasons, as was Charles himself. And that's worth reminding ourselves this, because when someone comes out with a statement that this earth evolved by chance, that man came from the ground, like from the animal uh, world, a man is evolving up, man is an animal glorified, we have to ask ourselves, why would someone come out, come out with such a statement? Who does it benefit? Well, if Charles was a Freemason, as he was, and if his grandfather and father were Freemasons, as they were, that allows us to understand the mindset of such people. He's also raised without a mother, so he came under his father's wings, as it were. This also feeds into his uh, book, The Origins of the Species. When it first came out, it sold out within 24 hours. Mm -hmm. And the suggestion has been that his friend Julian Huxley, who was also a Freemason slash member of the Illuminati, was able to mobilize the lodge, the boys, the craft, as they're called, to buy the book to create some hype. And yet at the same time, his book coming out, many of his uh, contemporaries were very critical, very dismissive of uh, Charles Darwin's statement, beliefs, when it came to evolution. Darwin would fail in his medical studies, so on advice from his father, he spent three years as a pre-divinity student at Christ College, Cambridge. He graduated with a BA in theology in 1831, but was never ordained. However, according to the author, uh, Peter Taylor, he did the following on page 119, and I'll give the details of the book shortly. Quote, Darwin never opened a Bible, or never opened his Bible, while studying at Cambridge. It appears his knowledge of the Word of God was non-existent, which is pretty typical for a man of his generation. If you were coming up in the 19th century, you either went into the church or into law. And here his father wanted him to go into the church, the Church of England, of course, because it was a career for life, which is still pretty much the same today. Most Anglican vicars start on a decent salary and they keep their heads down. They can pretty much retire on a good salary. If they make it to the level of bishop, they go to the House of Lords and I believe they can go into the House of Lords and sign in and sign out and receive £300 just for arriving. It's an abuse, of course, but it's also a perk to those that are in organised religion. But Darwin never even opened his Bible while studying at Cambridge. It appears his knowledge of the Word of God was non-existent. It doesn't surprise me whatsoever. In 1857, he consulted a clairvoyant and met mediums. He would marry his first cousin. Today, this incest is outlawed in most nations. According to Taylor, on page 127, the Darwins were trying to create a superbreed race, a form of eugenics, similar to what the Nazis attempted to achieve. Now, most of this information is scoffed at, ridiculed by Darwinists. I remember doing some outreach work in Manchester maybe seven or eight years ago, and this guy walked over to me, and he said to me, uh, you're James Battelle, aren't you? And I said, I am. And he said, I've seen you on YouTube. And he said to me, uh, you wrote an article about evolution, which I'm reading for the service this morning. And I said, yes, I did. <laughs> and I said to him, friend or foe? And he was a big tall chap, maybe six foot one, mm -hmm. another bright spark. I think he went to Oxford, perhaps, or Cambridge, I don't know where it was. And he said to me, I want to uh, challenge you on what you wrote. I said, well, the article was written back in 2004, a long time ago. I can't remember much of what I wrote. And we had a bit of a discussion over the next three or four Saturdays. And he became somewhat of a nuisance, somewhat of a pest. And he, was, he wasn't he was uh, a dangerous pest, but he wasn't irritant. And uh, I gave him some of these quotes that I'm reading this morning. And he just didn't want to hear it at all. And I said, well, you're following a man called Darwin, which of course he was, probably still is. And I follow a man called Jesus. 
which I am and continue to do. And your man came from a Masonic background, mine didn't. Your man uh, married his cousin, mine didn't. Your man wanted to create this super race, the supremacy of the white race, whereas my man died for the sins of the world. And we had an interesting conversation, but it wasn't going anywhere. And after maybe three or four Saturdays, uh, I said to him, let's just call it a day. Let's leave it. It's not going anywhere. You know, I can't reach you. We're here to do, I know, we're here to do some work. And you're here just to clash with me. But Darwin was a very tortured man. And yet somehow along the way, he got himself on the Beagle, travelled around the Caribbean. Nice work, you can get it. Mm. We're not sure who financed it. And like I say, he was able to put his material into print form. Some of his writings are still held at Cambridge University. And some of his writings have also been suppressed. But when we analyse Charles Darwin, we come across a lady called Lady Hope, who apparently was a daughter of General Sir Arthur Cotton. Now, there's much dispute about this lady, Lady Hope, and there's really just two views. Either what I'm about to briefly touch on this morning is correct or it's not. But the two views would have you, know, would have you believe that either... This account is correct concerning Darwin's deathbed conversion, or it's not correct. Now, I personally am in two minds about this. I remember back in 05, we went to Liverpool, and we met uh, a Christian young earth uh, teacher called uh, John Mackay, an Australian. And uh, we had a quick chat with him. Interesting character, young earther, of course. And I said to him, do you think Darwin got saved on his deathbed? Absolutely not, he said. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, it's, it's a fake account, so on and so forth. I said, fair enough. So I went back to some research into it, and I thought to myself, I'm not overly sure he can just be so dismissive of it. I mean, this woman, Lady Hope, is a real person. Like I say, she was the daughter of a general, Sir Arthur Cotton. She was the wife of Admiral Sir James Hope. She authored 37 books, which can be found at the British Library. She was an ardent and faithful temperance worker. Evidence of Darwin's deathbed conversion would be affirmed by the following. James Fagan, an evangelist and temperance worker. Ishmael Jones in the Christian Herald. Uh, Booth Tucker of the Salvation Army. And a chap called A.N. Nichols would also hear Darwin renounce evolution. You've got four accounts concerning his alleged deathbed conversion. But you see, when you bring this up, people don't like to hear it. You see, if you spent your whole life following Charles Darwin and you've got the books and you've taught this all of your life, like Fred Hoyle did, and you have a change of mind, it's somewhat awkward to explain yourself to such people. And of course, you've made a living out of it. Mm. It's even more difficult, and that's why it's so laughable when you come across these atheists that make a living attacking the Bible, attacking what we believe as Christians. Such people are obsessed with Almighty God, but of course they're not saved. So when it comes to Charles Darwin's deathbed conversion, I don't know. I know that when he was old, getting up in years, he called for one of his servants to get the book of Hebrews. Mm. And uh, the book was found for Charles Darwin as he was getting up in years, and it was brought to him, and it was read to him. Do I really believe that he got saved in his deathbed? I don't know. Personally, maybe not. I kind of think in a man of his status, of his age, you know, all the damage that he did was perhaps past redemption. But I don't know. But here's an interesting quote from Charles Darwin. When I was a young man with unformed ideas, I threw out queries, suggestions, wandering all the time over everything, and to my astonishment, the ideas that I took, or the ideas that I have, became like wildfire. Took off like wildfire. People made a religion of them. That's an interesting statement, because as an unsaved man, probably a bright man, he was uh, discovering himself, he was trying to work out what was what, and to his surprise... His findings took off, a bit like the Scientology cult, much to uh, uh, its founder's uh, surprise. Ron Hubbard, thank you. It took off, and it's still going strong to this day. Darwin said the following, quote, My work is a devil's gospel, close quote. And I remember a guy came up to me on the street maybe 10 years ago, a Canadian, another Darwinist, and uh, he was a very bright guy. And I said to him, this is what Darwin said. My work is a devil's gospel. He never said that. That's a lie. It's not true. They get very defensive, these people. And I gave him the quote and the source, but he wouldn't listen to me. He said, no, he didn't say that. It's not true. 
And I said, well, much of his writings are held at Cambridge University. In fact, his first autobiography from 1876 was heavily edited and revised by his son, Francis, on orders from his mother, Emma. According to uh, Peter Taylor's book, some 6,000 words were quietly omitted so as not to cause Darwin's estate further embarrassment mm -hmm. due to his unorthodox views. Much, much material about Charles Darwin. John Paul II, to his utter shame, once said that evolution is more than a hypothesis. The uh, Pope before Francis, Ratzinger, would also reaffirm that. In fact, all Catholic Popes, going back to Pius XII, most churches now believe that. And that's why Paul is warning about science, falsely so-called, which some professing have had concern their faith, and they're going to get egg on their face. So like I said from part one, I think when we try and assess evolution and atheism and Darwinism, I don't think there's a silver bullet per se to completely destroy it. What we are discovering are Christians that are pushing back against it, trying to uh, offer the scripture and material from the word of God and even using evolution itself to refute it. But like I say, it's not going to be easily annihilated. It's like Catholicism. It's a cancer. On top of that, the state finances it, the churches promote it. But whenever I think of evolution, I go back to that line from uh, that well-known film, The Sound of Music. Nothing comes from nothing, nothing ever could. And yet, when you think of evolution, or if you talk to an evolutionist, and I've met some, unfortunately, over the years, they actually believe that this universe came from nothing by chance and is now running itself, which is a frightening thought because the Earth spins at a thousand miles an hour, I believe. The weight of the Earth is immeasurable. The stars, the moon, the planets are so finely tuned that to be of the opinion, with a straight face anyway, that such came by chance is just ludicrous. This goes back to a person's mindset. This goes back to a person's heart being desperately wicked. People believe that they have the truth, but the ends thereof are the ways of death. And this is why it's so sad when you try and speak to people about what's going on. But the consequences of evolution are obvious. For example, over the last 15 years, the amount of swearing and blasphemy on UK television has rocketed to a staggering 500%. The National Health Service, Britain's frontline emergency service, is almost at breaking point with cases of sexually transmitted viruses, alcohol-related illnesses, smoking, respiratory problems, so on and so forth, just increasing left, right and centre. Abortion continues to go through the roof because people are told from a young age there is no God, it's all about the here and now, and you can do what you want. But like I said last night, unsaved politicians and even so-called church people will attack those of us which take a stand, those of us which preach on the streets, those of us which try and get the gospel out, and yet you never hear them attack pornography, alcohol, tobacco, or other vices. They're too busy attacking us, because, of course, we are a threat to such people. Of course, we were told from Second Timothy chapter 3 that in the last days, before the Lord would return, there would be perilous times, men would be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, Incontinent, fierce, despise of those things that are good, or those that are good. Traitors, heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God. Having a form of godliness. There's your Catholics, there's your Anglicans, there's your religious crowd. But denying the power thereof, denying the Holy Ghost, denying the, uh, the Scripture, denying the new birth. From such turn away, on top of that rebuke as well. For this sort are they which creep into houses... And lead captive silly women laden with sins, led away with diverse lusts, ever learning, and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. So time after time we are warned about such people. But we go back to evolution, we go back to those that have this mindset, not wanting to lose face, wanting to be part of a clique, part of a system. And churches are the same too, churches are very much in the same sort of category. They're like football clubs, very prideful, very tribal what church do you go to? Or we go to such and such a church. It's a wonderful church. We have a great pastor or a great pastoress. You know, we are Roman Catholic. We are 1.6 billion strong. We are Islamic, 1.5 billion strong, whatever the figure is. Or we are this or we are that. Who cares? It makes no difference. In fact, we discussed it a few nights ago when the Lord's 
uh, came, he called sinners to repentance, and on two occasions he would feed the 5,000 and the 4,000, and by Acts chapter 1, only 120 people are in the upper room. Maybe a quarter got saved on both occasions, and yet when push came to shove, no more than 120 people in the upper room. So it is a problem. It's something which isn't going to be easily uh, destroyed. But when we look at the scripture, we go back to the word of God. The Bible predicts 65 prophecies of the Messiah before he was born. They would range from 4000 BC to 400 BC. According to the Bible, God would bring these supernatural events to pass, which some mathematicians believe the odds of happening by chance are 1 out of 10 to the 148th power. And so according to the Bible, God has fulfilled this prophetic jigsaw. And it is recorded and preserved in scripture to this day. But because people don't preach the Bible, because churches don't believe the Bible, you don't hear this. All you get is evolution. If you speak to a Catholic, and you will from time to time, and some of these Darwinists are Catholics, some of these Catholics are Darwinists teaching in universities and schools, they will have you believe that the Bible is a Catholic book. Well, that's somewhat of a joke, because three quarters of the Bible were written before Rome ever arrived, being the Old Testament, of course. The Catholic Church is the biggest private interpreter on the face of the earth. Luke 24, 45 tells us that the law and the prophets and the Psalms spoke about Christ. Scripture cannot be broken. So three quarters of the Bible existed before the Catholic Church even began. And we know by the end of the second century that the church fathers, the church leaders, would quote the scripture 87,000 times. So even if we were to lose all of our Bibles... We could still rebuild the Bible based on the quotes from the first two centuries, being the Church Fathers, of course, 87,000 times. So when the Church of Carthage, or the Council of Carthage, excuse me, affirmed that the New Testament would consist of 27 books, we already knew that. The early church knew that for 200 years before Carthage we even called into question. But again, you're not told this. If you are just a typical person going about your everyday business, you wouldn't be told such material. You'd be led to believe that it's evolution, that this is an old earth, which goes back to being deceived, being a dangerous person, and perhaps being demon-possessed as well. Liberals will attack conservative Christians, such as us, for our, quote, repulsive beliefs, close quote. Yet they will never attack lewd and explicit pop songs, like their lyrics, or movie stars, like the violence. Both groups of people have destroyed probably millions. And yet, if you look at uh, any Hollywood star, any movie star, any music star, they continue to ruin people's lives with their music. And yet, I remember reading a quote from Madonna some years ago, and she said uh, that she hasn't got a television, that she won't allow her children to watch television, but she's more than happy to let your children watch her on television and become corrupted by her filth. It's an abomination. People say, well, this is very interesting, what you've been saying over the last three messages, but I'm a good person. When I die, I'm going to be okay. Well, listen to this. Almighty God would allow his only begotten son to be tortured and die naked on a pagan wooden cross in the presence of unsaved people and also his closest and dearest. Why would he spare you? If his own son was tortured to death, and he was, he's not going to just bypass you. If you're not saved, you're lost. But again, this isn't taught. This isn't preached. People think that Jesus loves everyone, and you can do as you please, and there's no consequences to living a reprobate life, which, of course, is a lie. If you don't repent, if you don't receive Christ as your Savior, you will perish. And that's the whole point of our little group coming together this week to get the gospel out, to give out tracts, to try and speak to people. And yes, it is pretty depressing. We spoke to a well-known journalist yesterday, a very uh, conservative journalist, sympathetic to what we would hold to, and he was very negative about the way that the world is going, and rightly so. And I thought to myself, but the scripture says from Matthew 7, 13, how the road to hell is wide, but the gate, the entrance to heaven is narrow. On top of that, I heard a sermon a few nights ago, and the preacher said that in every generation, 80% are lost. 80%, and I thought he's right, 80% would be lost. I've been saved 15 years, and I've been very privileged to go around the UK and the parts of the world with the gospel. And to the best of my knowledge, no one's ever come up to me in the street and said to me, are you born again? I've had people give me tracts or flyers for their church. I've had people give me business cards to uh, ministries that they like online. I've had people tell me about their church services. 
and their religion and this and that. But as I sit here this morning, as honestly as I can say and as clearly as I can recall, no one's ever come up to me in the street and said, do you know Jesus? Are you born again? And that's pretty sad, isn't it? So I think that figure of 80% is about, is about right. But that fits in with scripture. That fits in Matthew 7, 13 to 14. And that's why whatever you do, whether you're Calvinist or not, only a few are going to be saved. But as Paul would say, for me to live is Christ, but to die is gain. So we just keep on pushing on. We don't become discouraged. We do what we do. We understand the Lord has spoken to us through his word. And his conversations, if you will, have been recorded back in the Old Testament and in the New Testament. So we have an infallible source of such conversations. If God wasn't God, if he hadn't revealed himself to us, we'd be in trouble. But he has revealed himself to us. And on top of that, he's given us the Holy Ghost to know that we are saved. So we have the Holy Ghost with the scripture, we have creation, revelation, you know, we've got a lot going for us. And yet in spite of all that, it still doesn't seem to be enough for a lot of people. People still want to have visions and prophecies and have trips to heaven and back. It's like the scripture's not enough for them. But uh, as the Lord would say concerning the rich man in hell, if somebody from the dead would go to such a person's family, that wouldn't necessarily mean they would be saved. You know, even somebody being resurrected doesn't guarantee a person would believe the gospel. So why would you need more trips to heaven and back? Why would you need more visions to heaven and back? So, as I wrap this message up, all I will say is this, that Charles Darwin and men like him have done much damage. Whether or not he was saved, we won't know until we get to glory. It's nice to think that he could have got saved, and it's not impossible, but I think it's unlikely for a number of reasons. I think he was perhaps exploited to some extent. He had friends in the lodge. He had... Uh, Illuminati friends who were able to help him to get his book published and sold. On top of that, he would be uh, re-endorsed by Karl Marx many years later. And Marx was very much uh, a lovey from those on the left, very much adored. And of course, that man, Marx, would feed into communist Russia. And millions upon millions of people would die due to communism, atheism, socialism, call it what you will. And of course, Marx wasn't Stalin, we understand that. But Stalin was able to use a lot of Marx's writings. Who got it from Darwin, who was also a racist. And he said that the white man was supreme to the black man, which again is never taught in uh, evolution, uh, <coughs> evolution circles today. But he did believe that. He was a Freemason. He married his wife, who was his cousin. He also had some deformed children, which needs to be also put on microphone. And um, his disciples were pretty much... Uh, questionable people. In fact, even Karl Marx would have some of his own children who would die in starvation, die in famine because their father was a lazy reprobate, a lazy good for nothing, pretty much living off uh, angles. So these are very dangerous people to be following and I think, as I say, if you're not saved, you will be following someone, either secular or religious. Everybody follows someone to some extent, whether you know it or not, whether you accept it or not. And that's why it's so important to follow the Lord Jesus Christ to get saved and to take a stand for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints and to be aware of this vain babblings, oppositions of sites falsely so called, which some professing of ed concern the faith, just ruined by their faith, not in reference to losing their salvation, but they've had their faith overthrown, which is also spoken about from first Corinthians fifteen. Grace be with thee, Amen. And I will leave you with that uh, piece of scripture from uh, 1 Timothy 6, 20 to 21. <laughs>